Gospel of John, chapter 1. Each week as I do my Bible study, somewhere along the course of my Bible study, I run into something and, well, that makes perfect sense. So that's where the sermon starts from, and then I work from there. Well, this week we got up at 6 o'clock, Got around, ate our breakfast and went to work and got done at 6 at night and we spent the next couple hours trying to shower the insulation off of us and that's real good when there's no water pressure and the water is freezing cold. That's not an easy thing to do. Then you turn right around we go back, we eat supper and then we have time for Bible study and everybody's wiped out, including me. But we would spend an hour, hour and a half in Bible study and the last evening I, we went through some of the disciples. And in the middle of it, it dawned on me that Andrew is a disciple that I, I think the most about. But most people don't think about Andrew. So that's where I'm going to go today in this. And I, I heard a, a joke just a couple of days ago. And let, let me start out with this. The guy starts uh, each and every night going to bed upstairs. And his wife would always hear something in the kitchen. Every night. Every night for 30 years, she would wake him up in the middle of the night and say, somebody's in the kitchen. Go check. He would get up basically in his sleep and wander down the stairs and look around the kitchen and walk back up and say, nobody's there. 30 years into this, every night. One night, she woke him up like always, 2 a.m. Somebody's in the kitchen. Go check. He wanders down, and as he turns into the kitchen, he meets a barrel of a gun right between the eyes. It's an old hobo. Has broke into the kitchen to get something to eat. So he's, uh, the guy says, I don't want to hurt nobody, but i got to have food. And the man says, you're welcome to all the food. You don't have to have a gun. He said, okay. So the man sat down with him. And they made sandwiches, and he got the guy out, just gave him all the food he wanted. They sat and talked a little while, and the hobo got his pistol and put it back in his pocket, and he said, i got to be going now. And he said, just a minute. You can't leave till you meet my wife. She's been expecting you for 30 years. Has there ever been that person that you were expecting, but then when they showed up, it would have shocked you that they were actually there? Well, that's what we're talking about with Jesus for 400 years since Malachi. They've been preaching that that's the next thing. We're, not, we're supposed to expect Jesus to be here, the Messiah, the Christ. Now, it had been started even before that. So the Jews had been preaching for basically a thousand years that the Christ was coming. For 400, it was the message. Now, as you begin to study, if you put the Gospels together, you find out that, before I read this, let me tell you, Andrew had been listening to John the Baptist preach. And John the Baptist preached that Jesus was coming. He, it, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Andrew, it says, was one of his followers. So he heard the message over and over. And apparently one day, John the Baptist points out Jesus to everybody in the crowd. So Andrew went to listen to him in the city of Bethsaida, which is where Andrew was from. So he's listening to Jesus, pre to Jesus speak, and when he gets done, he goes back down the bank of the river there, the, the Sea of Galilee, goes back down the bank. There's his brother, Simon Peter. Right on down the bank a little farther, there's a couple of partners named James and John. But he goes to his brother and he begins to talk. Now, I want you to see some things here in a guy by the name of Andrew. Verse 40. John 1, 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, about half of the time that you find the name Andrew... It'll either be with an entire list of disciples or it's going to say Simon Peter's brother. I don't know about anybody else here, but that's tough. Anybody here was a younger brother, younger sister, and what you heard about in school was... See, I grew up the baby of five boys. Them boys had been into everything, plus cousins. I was always somebody's little brother, somebody's little boy, somebody's little cousin. It was just what it was. And after a while, it gets aggravating. No matter what happens, it does get aggravating. 
No, they're my big brother. And after a while, I got to where that's what I said to people. Are you Larry's little brother? Are you Leon's little brother? Are you Walter's little brother? No, they're my big brother. But see, Simon Peter was the big name. He's the one that everybody's heard about. Andrew, nobody's heard about Andrew. Everybody wants to be Simon Peter. But how is it that Simon Peter comes to Jesus to start with? He first finds his own brother Simon. And he said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So he went to his own brother. That's how Simon Peter started out. One of the most famous preachers of our day and age was a man by the name of C.H. Spurgeon, which if you have anything to do with church much, you're going to hear Spurgeon's evening and mornings and things like that. Was called the Prince of Preachers. Well, uh, in our generation, well, before me, he preached in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was considered one of the greatest preachers to ever walk on the planet. The day that he was saved, the church didn't even have a pastor. The church didn't have anybody who could speak. They convinced an associate pastor from a church down the road of very little size to come to their church and speak one Sunday morning. That's how C.H. Spurgeon was saved through the ministry of a guy who basically never preached. The man never preached more than a half a dozen sermons in his entire life, according to C.H. Spurgeon, but one of them touched him. And the Holy Spirit worked through that to see that man saved. And C.H. Spurgeon saw thousands upon thousands upon thousands saved. Simon Peter was such a great preacher that he saw thousands saved. He saw thousands in a day saved. How is it that he was introduced to Jesus Christ? A man named Andrew, his brother. How many of us don't realize how important it is that Andrew is in our church? Now we're going to go through just a couple of things today, but the, the old saying goes, if you're ordinary, that's what God can do extraordinary things with. How many people woke up this morning and said, Man, I hope I find out today that I'm just ordinary. That's what you're going to find out. Most of us are pretty doggone ordinary. How many of us have got the ability that Simon Peter did to speak and people just stop and, and it changed their life? Very few. But how many of us have the ability to say, I met the Messiah. I know who Christ is. Each and every one of us. So how many Simon Peters do we have in a church at a time? Usually none. Honestly. They come along once in a generation. The Billy Grahams of the world come along once in a generation. The Billy Sunday. The C.H. Spurgeon. Those people are not everywhere. How many of you have ever heard a preacher that you would say, my goodness, I wish I wasn't saved just so I could get saved? Oh, I have. I have. His name was Ed Murdy. And every time I heard Ed preach, Charlotte, we were raised with his kids. Every time he preached, I'd sit back there and think, man, I wish I was a sinner. <laughs> man, I'd get up there quick. This is good. It was unbelievable how good he could speak. Never had nothing to his name. But see, how many of those are there? How many have we met? Everybody in here has probably met a preacher or heard a preacher somewhere along the line and you thought, man, that guy can preach. Think about that. Of all the sermons, of all the people. But how many people can be Simon Peter? Almost none. How many can be Andrew? All of us. So it starts out by, by Andrew going himself and learning about Jesus. So first of all, folks, you've got to take yourself to where Jesus is at. How many of us want to tell everybody else what to do? But we don't want it to start with us. I know what's best for everybody else. But don't tell me what's best for me. See, Andrew started out and he went and listened. He's the one that, said, that made the search that 
that made up in his mind. Then he went immediately to his own brother. I have found it. You've got to come listen to this guy. This is the Christ, the Messiah. Now, you know, I'm thinking his brother's probably thinking, now get out of here, I'm fishing. Now, as Jesus comes along, Jesus stops and speaks, and even Simon Peter was touched. And then Jesus says, follow me. And Andrew was already there. He was ready to roll. And Simon Peter went with him. Now, as we begin to continue to read here, you're going to find out that that's all it really ever tells us about Andrew. He just kept taking people to the Lord. But he had to start with himself. You have to start with your relationship with God. Because, folks, if you don't have one, and you tell everybody else about him, think about that. Have you ever had anybody tell you about the Lord and you know they're so messed up it's unbelievable? How far does that words go? Right out of their mouth and they flop to the ground because you ain't listening. Oh boy, nobody said a word about that. Said he first finds his own brother. We found him. Then in verse 42 it says, And he brought him to Jesus, which by this time, if you read all the Gospels, Jesus apparently is coming down the bank of the, of the Sea of Galilee there, and he says, come on, we found him. He's right up here. So as Jesus is coming down the bank, he meets them coming up. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is being interpreted the stone. What you're going to find out is Jesus always seems to see these things in people. Let, let's, let's move on. The day following, so the very next day, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and he finds Philip. And he said, follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, which is the same town, the city of Andrew and Simon Peter. Philip finds Nathanael. So now we went from Andrew to Philip. Philip finds Jesus, he talks to him, he follows him, and then he says, I know a guy named Nathanael. He needs to know about this. Well, it seems so simple. But how many of us think there's this great big miraculous thing that happens? The great big miraculous thing is that we decide to humble ourselves. What have I got? Most people, by the time they know me a few months, are sick and tired of listening to my testimony. Because, folks, I got it. And that's all I know positively. I know where I was at. I know how I met Jesus Christ. I know how that changed me and my family. And I know what it's meant to me ever since. That's all there is. Boy, we make this thing complicated. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, let me tell you, He will change your life. When He says, follow me, He means follow me. Become like me. And what's funny is He sees that stone now, how many of us remember a little bit about Simon Peter? Simon Peter was a, woo, he was a temperamental outfit. He was what in my family we would call a character. And boy, if you get called a character by my bunch, you're a character. He's a character. He's a person who later on is going to actually deny Christ. He's the one that wants to chop off somebody's ear when they come to find Christ. He's the one that cusses people at the fire while they're crucifying Christ. He's got all these problems. What's he do when Jesus was crucified? The Bible says he went back fishing. Didn't even know where to turn. So man, it ain't so great to be Simon Peter after all, is it? See, there's an up and a down to these personalities. To be that dynamic, there's a roller coaster involved. There's ups and there's downs. And the ups are really up and the downs are really down. And I pray for you that you don't have that personality because it's rough. It's a hard way to live. Up, down, up, down. See, that's why God sent me Charlotte. Because, see, I'm just going, whoo, whoo. I mean, I'm firing off like a... Uh. And Charlotte's always like, let's calm down. Then after I get calmed down a little bit, she said, now let's move on. When we move on, I'm... She said, no, now let's calm down. See, you've always got to have that in your life. And God puts us together like that. Andrew and Simon Peter. 
Simon Peter would have been a horrible mess without his brother. His brother was always there to say, let's just do this. He was always that calming influence. Now how many of don't raise your hand. Don't put up that raise your hand sign. How many of us have those family members that are just, woo! You don't know where they're coming from. They're up one day and down the next. They're happy as a lark. Meet them tomorrow. They just, oh, everything's bad. And then the next day, woo, woo, woo. We've all got them. We all know people like that. But then in their life, God will put somebody who will be much more steady. That's what Simon Peter needed. So we need Andrews. We need Phillips who will stop and say, yes, I believe, and let me tell somebody else. So where you've been... That's your testimony start. Where was I headed? I was headed, well, perfectly honest. Most of my first cousins who did not get saved and start the church went to the penitentiary. Just about all of them. And the girls, a couple of them have, but basically they married people who went to the penitentiary. That's where the family was headed. But what changes that? Jesus Christ. I know when I met Him, I didn't want to do the things I did before. Now what did I do? Sometimes I did the things I did before. But I didn't want to. I knew better. Then it changes your life. You, you have a testimony. If you're here and somebody took you to church, we met a guy in Illinois this week. His name was Bo. What was Bo's last name? I don't remember. He's, he told me he was 83, 84, something like that. And I said, well, he just turned 83, I believe is what he said. I said, how long have you been going to church here? He said, 83 years and nine months. And I said, really? And he said, my mama brought me here every Sunday before I was ever born. How many of you got a testimony like that? That's a fabulous testimony that your mama took you to church even before you were born. Some of us don't have that. Some of us do, but you still have a testimony. You still had to choose to follow Jesus Christ. And if you haven't made that choice, then you're still back on number one. Where are you headed? We're all headed to the same place before Jesus comes in. Now let me read a little farther here. So Philip says, I know somebody too. I know a guy by the name of Nathaniel. So he finds Nathanael and he said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael says, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? Wow. I don't know how many people here are from the wrong side of the tracks, but Jesus is from the wrong side of the tracks. I can appreciate that. How many people here can appreciate being from the wrong side of the tracks? How many people can appreciate the fact that you were born with two strikes against you just by your last name, where you were born? Oh, and so many people think, oh, people don't like people in my family. So many people think that. Jesus wasn't any different. Nathaniel's not a bad guy. He just said, is there ever anything came good out of Nazareth? And Philip says, come and see. Just take a look. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and he said to him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Jesus already knew him. Never met him, but he already knew him. He said, that, that's a good guy. He just got done saying that Jesus couldn't be any good because he's from Nazareth. But Jesus looks in and sees. Simon Peter, that one with that terrible temper, he looked in and he saw a stone. He saw somebody who would be a rock one day for him. When he sees Nathaniel, somebody who's apparently a bigot, that's pretty much what that is. He don't like people from Nazareth. Ain't no, nothing ever good ever come from there. Jesus looks in and sees somebody who, there's no guile. He's not trying to trick anybody. This is who he is. How many of us are trying to change our personality? Jesus looks in and sees who you are. And the funny thing is, he sees the best. How 
often do we look at other people and we don't see the best? When we look at other people, do we see their best trait or do we see their worst one? Think about that for a second. Jesus looks in and he says, I see, I see there's no guile. He's not trying to trick anybody. Maybe he don't like where I'm from, but he's honest. And he's going to go on and he says, And Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and he said, Before that Philip called you, when you was under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. So there was nobody around. He knew what Jesus was talking about, but there was nobody to see him. Jesus answered and he said, Because I said unto thee that I saw thee under a fig tree, believest you? Thou shalt do greater things than these. And he said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. I, I got this little note for myself. The ordinary becomes extraordinary. When? When we let Jesus use our best. Think about that. Jesus uses our best. They have those contests at ball games, and they'll have somebody stand from half court and make a $50,000 shot or whatever it is. And I remember several years ago, they had one where the guy's at half court and they give you the ball. Now, for $50,000, you can make a half court shot. Or we'll give you $5,000, and it was a Celtics game, and Larry Bird will shoot a free throw. If he makes a free throw, you get five grand. Folks, I'm handing him the ball. $5,000, I'm, I'm going to get it. What's the chances of me backing off and doing something? It ain't it's almost zero. See, a basketball in one person's hands is different than a basketball in somebody else's. See, when you let Jesus take your best attributes, he sees them. He knows how to use them. Why don't we let him use them? Well, first of all, I'll just give you a couple because we're afraid somebody will turn us down. I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus and they're going to say, huh, guess what? That might happen. Guess what? You won't be the first person it ever happened to. And guess what? It won't be your fault. We have to be Andrew. We have to be Philip. Otherwise, there are no Simon Peters and Nathaniels. Now let me go, I'm going to jump forward one more story here because I want to keep moving. John chapter 6. A story I guarantee you everybody knows. Because we're all worried. We're all worried about that somebody turning us down. We're all worried about, well, I don't know what to say. Oh, now. Now, that one's a raise your hand deal. How many people have ever, well, I don't really want to tell them about the Lord because I don't know what to say. I don't know that much about what if, what if they ask a question. You got a testimony. I'm not a Bible expert. What I know is, before Jesus Christ, I needed him, I accepted him, and now, after Jesus Christ. That's all there is to it. So, let me tell you about being worried about things here. John chapter 6. I'm going to start reading verse 8. I want you to see something. Guarantee you've heard this sermon. If you've been in church, you've heard it. Guarantee it. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, there is a lad here which has five loaves and two fishes. But what are they among so many? What were they? How far is five loaves and two fishes going to go with 5,000 men along with women and children? Not going to go anywhere, is it? Come on. Not going to go. It ain't going to feed nobody. We're going to get about two people, and they're going to start fighting over about the third piece. And if Randy Baker was there, that won't even feed him. Amen? Now I got an amen out of that from Mar Myra. That ain't enough. But he says, here's what we got. This is Andrew for you. Here's what we got. Don't seem like much, but that's all there is. 
You take what you've got to Jesus Christ and what's He do? He multiplies it. He makes it enough for everybody. I know how many people in our churches today say, I ain't got no talent. I ain't got a gift. Don't call God a liar. He says everyone has gifts. Everyone has talents. You just got to find yours. All you got to do is pray and He'll show it to you. It's not a secret. Many people know their talents. They know their gifts. They just don't want to use them because they're afraid they're not enough. What would have happened at this day? Jesus knew what was going on. He knows the kid's got this, but he's waiting. And Andrew's that person that says, well, all we got is this, but we'll start with that. And away he goes. See, I was a young man at age 15. I surrendered to preach. The preacher comes to me and he says, you're going to preach tonight. Sunday night, you're going to give a sermon it. We're going to have a youth night. Kind of like what we did here a couple weeks ago. I said, wow, what do I do? And he said, you preach. Well, I don't know how. He said, well, then you got the wrong calling. Because I can't tell you how to preach. You got to preach or not. He said, are you scared? And I said, well, no, not really. I'm just afraid I'll mess it up. He said, well, if you mess up, you mess up. You got to learn. So I got up. I had notes about this deep. And I was telling Josh, I had all these notes. And boy, I mean, I was just throwing them notes right and left. And looked up there at the clock and about 6 o'clock or whatever. And 6.30 and what's my turn? And I got up. And honestly, now I got the one thing that every preacher would like to have. The gift of gab and no nerves. I got the gift of gab, and I ain't never been nervous in my life. So, well, I can't say that. That's a lie. But it's been very, very seldom I've been nervous. And I'm not nervous standing in front of you guys, because guess what? You people put your britches on one leg at a time, too. And if you get mad while you got them on, most people get, get happy before they ever take them off. It's just pretty simple. Everybody's in the same boat. Jesus Christ died for whosoever. That includes me. It makes me and you the same. That's why I don't have any nerves about the thing. Why would I be nervous about his message? It's good. So I got up and I thought, man, I got this. This ain't no problem. So I started going through them notes and I'm preaching. And I remember the sermon. I could, I could give it again today. I was talking about Tylenol. You remember Tylenol when it first came out? Well, I do. I may be the oldest one in here. But you got this Tylenol. I never heard of Tylenol until I was a grown kid. You know, I mean, we, we took, man, we had mud dauber nests and skunk grease and stuff. But we got Tylenol. If you had a headache, you take a couple Tylenols and you had pretty good confidence that it get, that you get better. Amen? If we had as much confidence in God as we have in Tylenol, we'd be in pretty good shape. That's what I preach. That's about all of it. <laughs> you just heard pretty much the entire sermon. I looked back up and I was going through notes and I said a few things and I looked up and I'd been there seven minutes and I had went through 20 pages of notes and I'm thinking, well, what do I do next? I said, well, I guess that's it. And I went and sat down. The preacher got up and he you know, went on with something else and we went home that, that evening and did I do all right? Well, yeah, but what was all them notes for? I said, I'm not positive. That's just what all preachers do. I never had to have them. They were always a nuisance to me because I'd try to stick to them. Now see, did I have any clue that my sermon was going here when I started? Nope. When I start, I know what the sermon's about and that's it. See, I've got this ability, the gift of gab. And I know my testimony. I know who my Savior is. Maybe I won't see thousands saved in a day, but I can tell you about Jesus Christ. Is Andrew any less a disciple? No. We serve a Savior who saves thousands in a day. We serve a Savior who's that big. But we also serve a Savior who takes the shyest person and gives them the ability to give a testimony. I don't care how shy you are. You can give your testimony. This was me before Jesus Christ and where I was headed. I needed Him. I accepted him, and here I am today. Maybe not much better off, but headed for heaven. And between here and there, I'm just going to learn and do better as I can. How many of us think we have to be perfect? 
before we can give a testimony. We have to be perfect before we can do this. We have to be perfect before we can do that. What we need to do is we need to start with that little boy and see ourselves that way and go to Jesus and say, this is all I got. This is all you gave me. What do you need me to do with it? And whatever he needs you to do with it, he multiplies it and makes sure it's plenty. Closest to nervous. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm about to close. The closest to nervous I've ever been, I went to Second Baptist in Springfield. Anybody ever been by Second Baptist in Springfield, Missouri? I went up there. John Marshall was a, was a friend of mine from pastor conferences and things, and he asked me to preach on a Sunday night that we're going to start a revival and have a different person each night. I got Sunday night. At the time, I was preaching at a church that ran probably 150, 160. We went up there and we parked on a Sunday night. You could put our entire building, everything, inside their sanctuary. My oldest daughter was about four or five. And we start walking in. I got my fancy suit on for the big time church in Springfield. Got my fancy suit, got my brand new Bible. Striding right in and Michelle pulls on my leg. And I said, yeah. And she said, you could fit, you could fit all of our property, church, and everything inside this building. And I looked around and I thought, that's right. Wow. How did a little old goob, what my kids call me, how did a little goob from Pumpkin Center, Missouri, in the middle of nowhere with all the problems we had, how did I end up in this building? God must have made a mistake somewhere. I got up and I, for just a second I thought, I may ought to be nervous. This may be something to be nervous about. I looked around and I, these people look pretty much the same as the people I know. I got up there and all these lights shining and there's about 500 people down on the main floor there and this ghost. And all at once I looked up and there was a whole other congregation on the second floor. <laughs> wow. And I turned around there and I said, Dr. Marshall, you got a pretty good crowd here on Sunday night. I wonder if they're here to hear me. And he just kind of smiled and I, I, I explained to him that people from West Plains were you know, punk and center were much smarter than people from Springfield. Everybody, everybody in Pumpkin Center has heard of Springfield, and nobody in Springfield's ever heard of Pumpkin Center. <laughs> everybody laughed, and I thought, yep, they're just like us. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. And I got down, and it's probably the first time in the history, or maybe since, in that church, that anybody got down off that big old podium, because Dr. Marshall walks around, but he's up there like that high. If I stayed up there, I'd have fell and killed myself. So I got down, and I'm wandering through the building, and... Everybody just didn't seem to enjoy it. They're the same. If you've got 2,000 or two, you know what's the same? Jesus Christ. And when we begin to, to, to see ourselves as Andrews, you don't have to be Simon Peter. You don't have to be the greatest at anything. You just have to give what you've got to Jesus Christ. And how many of us have cheated Jesus out of what he's gave us? How many of us have not been Andrew? How many have not been Philip? How many have not been that little boy that said, all I got is this, but you can have it. What he gave you, he gave you so you can use it. That's a big burden on us. It's expected of us. It's time we begin to do it. It's time in our lives that we begin to say, I may not have much, but what I've got, do what you can do with it. That's how churches grow. That's how this congregation that followed Jesus grew. They grew because people were willing to say, we found the Messiah. We found the King. Can we say any different today? I'm going to ask the musicians to come forward. If you're here and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you should be able to say, I found the King. Anybody you know, you should be able to say, why don't you go to church with us? You know, pastor may be a goob, but we know Jesus Christ. We have found the King. That's really all we got. How many people look at church and you look around and you think, this is how many singers we got, this is how many preachers we got, this is how many Sunday school teachers we got. Man, some of the greatest churches have had none of that. Some of the greatest churches that have ever existed on this planet had Jesus Christ. And they were much better off than the ones that had the big time speakers. 
What we need is a whole lot of Andrews and fewer Simon Peters. There's places for Simon Peters, but they don't intermingle well. Ponder on it. I dare you this week to read what happens with Simon Peter and Paul. Read what happens every time they get within the same shouting distance of each other. They bash, they clash. But Andrews and Phillips can come in by the thousands and they never clash. You need the Simon Peters, you need the Pauls. But most of all, we need Jesus Christ to work with a bunch of Andrews. Now how many people here is a disciple? Oh, now, every person who's chosen to follow Jesus Christ is a disciple. Every person. Ponder on it. If you're here and you haven't chosen to follow Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you right now, you're headed the same place I was headed. You're headed down the wrong road, and that road will take you down the wrong path until you're dead. But once you find Him, when you realize you need Him, He'll get you off that and onto a whole other path. And when you get on that path, He takes whatever you've got, big or little, and He makes extraordinary things out of ordinary. How many have ever thought, boy, I just want to be ordinary? That's it. Andrew was just ordinary. 99% of us are just ordinary. But in Jesus Christ's hand, we become extraordinary. Every head bowed. Lord, we just ask right now that if there's any here that haven't chosen to follow you, that, that this be the time that they realize that, that we've found the King, that you are here among us. Lord, that you are the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah. And Lord, one day you will return for your church. And Lord, for those who do know you, that, that are disciples, that follow you, Lord, help them to realize that whatever they've got, it may not seem like much, but it's what you need. And you'll take it and do whatever needs to be done with it. We ask right now that any decisions need to be made, Lord, that they be made right now, that, that your Holy Spirit just deal with each and every one here. And once again, if anybody hasn't made a profession of faith in you, let this be the time that they do. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand.
back what they had. How many of us has God given something and we just hold on to it? If, you, if you're doing that, think about what that is. Think about who it is that's going hungry. If that little kid doesn't bring his fishes and his loaves. They're not enough. But with Jesus' help, they are. How many people around you go hungry spiritually because we hold back arguments? What you've got is not enough. But you have to be willing to give it up so that Jesus can use it. If you're here and you've had a hard time finding your gift, finding your talent that God wants to use, and you're sitting there thinking, well, I'd like to use my talent, but I don't know what they are, preacher. I guarantee there's a bunch here today thinking that. All you've got to do is find yourself a spot and pray, and God will re reveal to you what that gift is. That's not a secret. He wants you to use it. Why would He keep it secret from you? Ask Him what it is this morning. Find a place and just kneel down and say, what is my gift? Where do I fit in? Where do I use it? He'll reveal it too. Let's sing it.